गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग So, uh, good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you in the first talk of STEMS Qualifier Camp 2021. First of all, a hearty congratulations to all of you for qualifying the first stage of STEMS 2021. We are really proud of you because you cracked a quite a tough exam. So, uh, let's directly go to the talk. So, today the first talk will be delivered by Professor Ram Prasad Saptarshi. He is currently a faculty member in the School of Technology and Computer Science at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. So, uh, just a brief introduction about him. He did his PhD under the guidance of Professor Maninder Agarwal from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Currently, Professor Maninder Agarwal is in IIT Kanpur, and he will be also delivering a talk in the uh, today evening. After his PhD, he was a research fellow at Microsoft Research uh, India. Subsequently, he did his postdoc at Tel Aviv University. His current interests are in algebraic circuit complexity and pseudo randomness and derandomization. Today, he will be delivering a talk on commutators and showing you how beautifully we can link commutators to solving uh, several puzzles like Rubik's Cube, which most of you have a familiar with, and 15 puzzles, and uh, many of these. And he will also show you the uh, various applications of commutators in other places. So uh, over to you, Professor Ramkur. Uh, thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen and make sure everything is uh, OK. So is my screen visible? Am I audible and so on? Uh, uh, yes, sir. OK, great. Uh, OK, thanks for this amazing invitation. Um, so uh, I mean, this is a talk that I would have loved to give in person. Uh, I mean, to sort of maybe, I mean, it, there's a lot of hands-on stuff that we can do with this, but uh, I mean, given the circumstances, we do what we do. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to describe is I'm trying going to try and describe a particular concept, which is called commutators, which shows up in all sorts of places. And I'm going to try and give you two examples, two places where it shows up. Uh, one of them is perhaps a bit more fun, which is with regard to solving Rubik's cubes and stuff like that. And the other is about something to do with solving equations and so on. Uh, so um, this is a rather wide audience. I mean, like going probably all the way from something like eighth standard or ninth standard all the way to undergrads or something. So it's possible that, you know, there may be some parts of this talk which are maybe, you know, a bit too complicated or something, but I've tried to keep it as uh, grounded as possible. Uh, but please feel free to interrupt me for any questions at any point in the talk, uh, because I would really like this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, okay, so let's start off. So the point is the I mean, one way to describe commutators is using these sort of uh, these classes of puzzles, which are often called these combination puzzles. Uh, what do I mean by a combination puzzle? They're all puzzles of, I mean, this is something that you, a lot of you may have seen, which is called the 15 puzzle. Uh, basically there is one empty cell, but otherwise it's a four cross four grid of uh, small blocks. And what you can do at any step is sort of move blocks through this gap, basically move 13 to this end. Now the hole is here. Maybe then you can move 10 down, et cetera, et cetera. You keep moving these pieces and, such, and the hope is to eventually get to one, two, three, blah, 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 till 15 in the right order. And similarly, there is this class of this Rubik's class of puzzles, which is like, you know, maybe there's a two cross two, three cross three, blah, blah, blah and so on. And sometimes there are also these sort of weird looking puzzles, uh, like where you sort of solve, I mean, things turn along the diagonals or whatever. Okay, so that's one sort of puzzles. And then th this is like an interesting puzzle, which is uh, sometimes called oval track or sometimes called uh, top spin. So basically what you can do is you can either move all the, the whatever, the, I mean, all these numbers slowly across this long oval track or if four of them fit into this uh, central portion, you can just invert that central portion. So those are the two legitimate moves that you are allowed. And again, all of these puzzles are of the following type. Somebody will scramble this and give it to you. And you are supposed to reach a particular solved state, whatever that means. Okay. And you're just trying to do this in some way possible. And the only thing I want to, I want to, uh, I'll call these combination puzzles in general to mean that Whenever someone makes a move, there is a notion of you undoing that move. Like in a Rubik's cube, if someone turns a face a certain way, 
you can certainly undo that so any puzzle where this you're basically making a bunch of moves where you can always undo whatever you're doing is what i'll call combination tricks and this to me is like it's going to be the some of the main glue for today's talk i'm just going to use this as an excuse to tell you about computators but i'll do this from the context of these things okay now let's completely like you know this is what we are going to do today we are going to have fun with this concept called computators and i'll you'll hopefully learn to solve the rubik's cube on your own i am not going to teach you to solve the rubik's cube but i'm rather i'm going to try and teach you to teach yourself to solve the rubik's cube and we'll also see how computators are relevant when it comes to solving equation these two doesn't seem like anything like each other but the you know there interesting connections and it's a really cool concept in mathematics in general okay so now i'm going to completely change tracks and i'll give you a puzzle i'm not going to tell you the solution and just move on so in any point if you feel like you are zoning out of the talk or you say something that you don't understand maybe here is something you can think about okay so here's what we are going to do so you are given a picture and you want to hang the picture so let's say there is a nail of this sort i mean any sensible person will hang the picture something like this okay but uh, this is no fun maybe you want to hang the picture in some completely complicated way now i don't even know whether this picture will stand at this point like if i let it go will it fall will it stand who knows okay but just anyway some complicated way to not hang the picture okay now so here is a here is a bunch of things suppose i have two nails i want to hang a picture but i want to keep track of the following three questions okay the three questions i want to ask are will the picture stay secondly will the picture stay when i remove nail 1 but relieve nail 2 as it is and the third question be will the picture stay when i remove nail 2 but i leave nail 1 as it is so we'll try to answer these these three questions for the following simple examples so suppose i hang the picture this way now it's immediate to everybody that of course the picture will stay because it's around the nails and whether you remove nail 1 or nail 2 i mean there's still one nail that's going to hold the picture so this one the answer to all three questions is yes 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 okay what about this well here the picture will stay but obviously the picture will fall off when i remove nail 1 and because then it's not held to anything but on the other hand removing nail 2 is not going to do anything to it i mean it's not even going around nail 2 okay and maybe this is a slightly more complicated thing i mean like you do some weird things like this i mean now will you can you can convince yourself you can ask yourself what is the answer to these three questions i mean this is not the puzzle i wanted to ask the puzzle i wanted to ask was the following i want you to hang the picture over these two nails such that firstly the picture should not fall okay that it, if you let go of the picture it should continue to stay okay? but i want the picture to fall whichever nail you remove that is if you remove nail 1 the picture should fall or if you remove nail 2 the picture should fall okay and so this is the puzzle try to find a way of putting your picture around these two nails in some way such that it stays but it somehow falls off no matter which nail you remove Um, I mean, if you have a rope, or I don't know, even earphones or something, you can actually try to do this with two fingers, and I mean, you can play around with it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Okay, maybe some of you already know the solution to it, or maybe you got a solution to by some hit and trial. I mean, you just tried various things, and one of them you just got lucky. Well, if you did get lucky, well, think about what happens when you don't have two nails, but you have three nails, or maybe you have ten nails. Okay. Mm -hmm. just think about it you know if any any point you sort of zone out in the stock i mean here is something that you can it's a nice puzzle to think about it. okay so what the hell are computators got to do with any of this okay a, a sort of a silly way of telling you what a computator is is a computator is what you get when you undo things strongly okay but i'll describe exactly what i mean by this but uh, it's just that i mean sometimes doing making mistakes is a good thing i mean you learn something new out of this okay so what do i mean by undoing things wrongly let's first ask ourselves how do you undo a sequence of operations so let's take a bunch of examples maybe a sequence of operations of the form you start with something but you add 5 first and then you multiply by 7 or maybe you are in a rubik's cube and you turn the right face clockwise and then the up face anti clockwise or something maybe that's a sequence of moves that you are doing or you are hanging a picture around a nail and maybe you go clockwise around nail 1 and then clockwise around nail 2 I mean, something i mean there is just a bunch of sequences of moves that you do 
and you want to know how do i undo this if i started with a number and i multiply and i did these two operations how should i undo and it's clear that you should certainly subtract 5 and divide by 7 but the question is in what order and the thing is when you add 5 and then multiply by 7 the right way of undoing it is you first divide by 7 and then subtract 5 that is if you have a sequence of moves you you need to start with undoing the last thing you did and then keep going on in the reverse direction right similarly if you have a rubik's cube and you turn the right face clockwise first and then the up face anti clockwise then the right way to undo it is you first turn you undo the whatever the up turn whatever that means and then you undo the right turn okay similarly going clockwise around nail 1 and nail 2 i mean you just go anti clockwise first around nail 2 and then around nail 1 okay this is this is how you should undo things so let's sort of abstract it out a little bit and say that whenever you are performing some operation a and then you perform operation b how do you correctly undo what you did you you so what does it mean to say you perform a and b and then on currently undo what you did so you first do a and b and b inverse this putting a minus 1 on top is just a way of saying i am undoing b okay so you do a b followed by b inverse and a inverse okay this is the right way to undo things but if you are if you are wrong in what you are doing sometimes what you may do is like you may do a and b then incorrectly undo what you did and you end up with what is called you do a you do b and then you undo a and then you undo b this is not the right way of undoing things okay but this is what a commutator is okay in plain english a commutator is just it's like saying you do a and then you do b and then you undo a and then you undo b okay and this is something that will keep showing up very often so whenever you see the square bracket a comma b it's just a shorthand notation for this thing it's just shorthand for saying you do a you do b and then you undo a and you undo b okay so this is what a commutator is and we are going to keep using this again and again in through this uh, thing so some of you may be thinking about right now is like you know we forget about commutators what the hell is the solution to this picture hanging on and i really think you should try it out i mean whatever you need i have told you okay you can just think about it and the next question you might be asking is like well what's this got to do with the rubik's cube and yeah this is what we are going to do next and then what about equation then that is something we'll do towards the end okay so so here is what the i mean here's a brief description about the rubik's cube it's probably something that all of you know but i will still state it uh so this was invented by erno rubik in the 1970s and it's a really interesting story there as well he was a professor of architecture and uh, he really wanted he didn't care about that as a puzzle in fact he didn't even think of it as a puzzle to him it was a question of if i want to construct a mechanism where all of these faces sort of move independently without the whole thing falling apart what should the internal mechanism be so he built this thing using wooden blocks and rubber bands and so on tied together to sort of you know to show that this mechanism can be built and then he realized that the moment he made even a few moves somehow the things got scrambled so much that and it's like you know you're just it begs you to try and solve it on your own and it got super super popular in the 70s and somehow in the 80s like uh, early 80s i think 83 or 84 or something the sales just uh, dropped massively and people thought that the craze has died and somehow in the 2000s i mean there was this speed cubing community that uh, completely blossomed and uh, after that it's become super cool again and uh, just to give a sense of you know, how quickly people solve the cube right now i mean the current world record the official world record for a single solve is uh, 3.47 seconds by yusheng du Uh, it's a remarkable uh, thing uh, so yeah so what we are going to do what we'll do now is i'll tell you a little bit about my personal story with the rubik's cube it's not much to say but i think there's a at least it made me learn an important lesson and i think it's, uh, it's i just want to convey that to people uh, so i was introduced to the rubik's cube by v vinay who is also an adjunct faculty at cmi uh, who is my uncle and uh, this is probably when i was about 15 years old or i don't know somewhere around there when he gave me a rubik's cube and said hey why don't you try solving it 
Okay. Obviously, I mean, I have no clue of how to solve things, but with about a year of tinkering with it or something, this is how far I could get. Okay. And uh, by this, what I mean is, most people will probably reach this point without too much difficulty. That is, they'll be able to solve what is called one layer. That is, the Rubik's cube is really made up of like lots of individual pieces, right? So there are some corners which have three colors. There are some edges that have two colors. But often, most people can set up one layer correctly, and after that, you are stuck. And the question is, why are you stuck? Well, if I have solved one layer correctly, and I don't want to destroy whatever I have done. There's literally nothing I can do, right? What is the point of me changing the bottom two things alone? So, and because of this, you sort of get stuck at this point and say you don't know what how to proceed. Now, this is where I was when my uncle met me again the next time, and uh, but that um, that point he said that he could have just given me a solution and said here is a sequence of moves you do this and you're done. But he did something which I think is far more important, which was he said no let's try and solve it on our own by ourselves. So. That summer, what we did was the following. The only thing I know at this point is to solve one layer. So let's do the only thing we can. We will mess up the cube, but we'll keep notes exactly what we messed up, and then we'll try to re-solve re this the top layer. And at this point, it seems like you know what the hell are we doing? So maybe I did something that I re-solved the top layer, but then you notice that hey, something weird has happened. Like earlier, this piece used to be a red yellow piece, and now suddenly it's a yellow blue piece. So you suddenly notice that oh you managed to if you if you keep track of exactly what are the what are the moves you did in the first setting and what are the moves you did in the second setting, now you have suddenly discovered a sequence to go from here to here, and then you realize hey we made progress now you have suddenly come up with this weird sequence of moves where it didn't do anything to the top layer, but then does something to the other pieces in some way, and if you carefully keep track of what it did and so on and maybe you'll be able to solve the cube by, by yourself and that summer that's what we did we just kept coming up with these guesses and eventually we we had a it's a horrible it's a stupid way to solve the cube it's it takes ridiculously long but that's not the point of this exercise the point of this exercise is that as a i don't know as a youngster it was something where i learned that i could do something which i didn't think i could do so that is the main takeaway that this had anyway Fast forward to a lot of, uh, I mean, when I joined TIFR, I met this guy called Nikhil Mande, who was a ex student at CM, and he was a PhD student at TIFR. Okay, and Nikhil Mande is like a, he is very very interested in Rubik's cube and so on. And in a completely different context, I was talking to him about commutators, and he got super excited. And I said, what do you mean? What is so exciting about it? And then he, Nikhil Mande, is a person who actually has the national, who held the national record. For the most number of Rubik's cubes all blindfolded and so on, and apparently when he solves the cube blindfolded, commutators are something that he keeps using often. And I had no idea that you could use commutators for things like this. And to me, this entire story is like a this is sort of what research is often like. Okay, I mean, you think something is a problem, but uh, often when you are having fun doing what you are doing, I mean, it just becomes a puzzle. So that's to me the main takeaway message that uh, we should have here, and. nothing gets solved almost in one day okay i mean most of the things i mean you need to make a little bit of progress that's all you need to do okay and the other thing is about you should be patient and you don't know where uh, sort of new ideas will come from like for instance this is a formula that some of you may have seen in high school it is about solving equations or something who would have thought that because that's how i got to know about commutator and who would have thought that had something to do with the rubik's cube so So at least this is like a high-level picture of uh, the story of what I want to say. Okay, so again, as I mentioned last time, what this talk isn't meant to do is to teach you to solve the cube. But what I hope this talk will do to you is at least teach you to find a solution on your own. Okay, and uh, at least get pretty close to it. Okay, so uh, so there's a particular message uh, I had on a chat. Uh, so I would have liked to do this like. physically with you guys so that you know i can show you the sequences and so on but uh, because of this uh, because of this current situation let's let's move to this online but i'm going to use a slightly different setup that i had on my web page which i added on chat and if people can just uh, share it in case people want want to try these things on their own that's all okay so this is just a nice online applet which sort of uh, 
which lets you try various things with rubik's cube it will be convenient for us to do these things so let's first set up some names okay so the usual setup is that you know the f refers to the front face the right refers to the right face up left back and down and whenever you put a prime after that i mean normally without a prime it means you move clockwise but if you put a prime it means you move anti clockwise so let's just look at a few examples so the first move is like moving front clockwise then this is like moving right clockwise and this is moving up clockwise and so on uh let me just uh, make life a little simpler make it a little shorter uh that is up clockwise and uh, if you want to move front anti clockwise you put front prime right prime and this is up prime and maybe you want to move a face like two rotations so then you do something like r2 so it's very convenient so there is a bunch of notations if you want you can play around with this like for example this m refers to the middle slice or rather middle s refers to the slice e is some equator or something anyway there are just some names okay to so that you know whenever we want to write down a sequence of moves it's just convenient to write it down uh, in this format okay so good so let's uh, so let's do the let's let's start with an example suppose i have a sequence of moves which is r and u okay so this is what i have done this is r followed by u what is the right way to undo this i should first be doing u prime and then i should be doing r prime so that would undo the sequence okay what's the wrong way of undoing it i first do r prime and then i do u prime so you end up with some mess uh okay some pieces are where they used to be but some pieces have moved etc etc i mean but never mind so this is what a commutator is so commutator the shorthand for this is just you write this bracket of r comma u which is just shorthand for r u r prime u prime okay so now that at least we know how to speak to each other when it comes to making these moves on the cube or something we can proceed to start doing something a little more interesting okay if you have questions i mean please feel free to interrupt me and so on okay so let's go back to this thing and uh, so what's the main message that i want to give for today the main message i want to say is that if you know how to solve one layer what do i mean by that i mean that you know you should be able to insert any piece to the top layer without disturbing anything else in the top layer i don't care about what happens in layer 2 and 3 i only care about what you do in the top layer and my claim is if you can do this then you should be able to solve the entire cube and i'll tell you how you can find a solution on your own okay now i don't know how many of you here know how to solve the top layer so uh, so let i'll do a little bit of that but let's ask ourselves suppose we end up in a situation of this sort okay i mean i have saw managed to solve the top layer i still want to solve the rest of the cube now what do you do really really want you want a sequence of moves that does not change anything in the top layer but hopefully it does something non trivial in the other layers right and ideally you would want a sequence of moves that few that moves as few pieces as possible okay something that maybe just moves three corners around or maybe three edges around or something because if you can do something like that then you can make create your own ways of putting these things together to solve the cube or something and this is precisely what commutators are for okay if you are looking to find a way to come up with a sequence of moves that moves very few pieces around that's how commutators are going to help you okay uh, so so before we do this let's look at a few examples and uh, get a sense of uh, what's happening so i don't know how many people here know how to solve even one one uh, i mean uh, oh, just the top phase so i'm just going to briefly tell you how to do this you may have different ways of doing this but it doesn't matter okay so so sir let's say this is the setup that you have i want to move this corner here okay so that's what i want to do this corner this white corner this white green red corner belongs here and i want to move it there so the natural thing to want to do is this but the problem is it messed up these two white pieces that originally was on the top okay 
So that's a, I don't want to mess those up. So let's instead do the following thing. Let's first move those two pieces away, away from whatever you're going to do, bring the corner into place, and then move those two pieces back. This is one way of doing it. Okay, maybe some of you may have a slightly different way of doing it, uh, which is what I sometimes call the conveyor belt move, uh, which is I want to move this piece up here, but instead what you do is you first knock that piece off, bring this conveyor belt down, put that piece back into its place, and then take the conveyor belt down. Okay, it's just some way of, uh, one way of solving a corner. I don't know, maybe you might have a slightly different way of doing it. I mean, I don't, I mean, it should not, it's not going to matter. So what we are going to do is we're going to somehow try and build clever commutators and see how this is going to help us get the sort of moves we are looking for, something that moves very few pieces together. So it's first important to understand what do commutators do, okay? So let's first get a sense of things and let's simplify stuff a lot and let's assume, let's pretend that the cube only has eight pieces. Whatever sequence of moves you do, you're shuffling these eight pieces in some way, okay? So I don't know, maybe there is some sequence of moves that you did, let's call that sequence one. And this just shuffles the first four pieces. In some way, I mean, like maybe it moves four here, one here, two here, and so on. And sequence two is the one on the right hand side. Sequence two only shuffles the last four pieces. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the, num the set of pieces that sequence one moves and the set of pieces that sequence two moves, they don't have any common piece because sequence one only moves the top half, the first four, and the sequence two only moves the, the, the last four. So there's nothing in common that's moved. But let's understand what the commutator will do. So since the commutator involves these inverses also, like how do you undo sequence one? Well, you move one back to where it was, two back to where it was, four back to where it was, and three back to where it was. This is the undoing of sequence one, and this is undoing of sequence two. Okay? Now let's put the commutator and see what we get. So we'll start with this. What does a commutator mean? You first do sequence one. So you end up with this situation. And then you do sequence two, you end up with this situation. So now the first four also got shuffled, the last four also got shuffled, but then you undo sequence one. So the first four somehow return to its original state and then you undo sequence two, the last four also return to its original state. So, and this is utterly useless because we did this complicated sequence of moves and it did literally nothing. Whatever you started off with, you ended up with exactly the same thing. But in some sense, it should not be surprising, right? Because as far as this piece three is concerned, sequence one moved it somewhere, sequence two didn't do anything to it, and sequence one inverse moved it back. Well, of course, so every other piece, I mean, since sequence one and sequence two are not really interacting with each other, I mean, they just move to some place and then they come back to where they were to begin with. So naturally, none of the pieces will move towards the end, okay? So let's make, let's go one step further and let's say that there was exactly one common piece. So now sequence one moves the first five pieces instead of the first four in some, some weird way. And this is what the inverse looks like. And sequence two is something that moves the last four pieces. And this is what its inverse looks like. Okay. Now, since this is the only whatever layer, I mean, or rather the only thing that seems to be moved in common by both sequence one and sequence two, let's just pay attention to it. What are the numbers we see here? There is a five and then there is two and there is eight. So we'll just remember five, two and eight because they'll become relevant soon. Okay. Now let's ask ourselves, what is a commutator going to look like? Let's first apply sequence one to get something. And then you apply sequence two and then you get something. And then you apply sequence one inverse, which is the undoing of sequence one, you get something. And then you undo sequence two, and then you get something else. Now let's focus on what happened from the start to the finish. Almost every piece seems to have gotten back to where it was to begin with, except these three locations. Pieces five, two, and eight alone moved. Okay, and five to eight were these sort of special things that we kept track of in the previous slide. Okay, that was the thing that was present in the common row. Okay, 
and this in general is a theorem about commutators this is a general sequence about i mean statement about commutators whenever you have sequence 1 and sequence 2 that move a single common piece sequence 1 could do all sorts of nasty things with other pieces similarly sequence 2 could do all sorts of nasty things with other pieces but if you look at what are the pieces they move in common suppose there is just one piece then the commutator will only move the following pieces whatever was the common piece whatever got moved to the common piece by sequence 1 this was i think 2 uh, or something in our previous example and whatever got moved to the common piece by sequence 2 which is basically which was 8 in the previous example okay so this is a commutator that will move only three pieces okay now why the hell is this useful on a rubik's cube so here is how it is useful so this is what the rubik's cube starts off with but suppose you have a sequence of moves that does this to the rubik's cube what do i mean by this i don't care about what it does to any of the pieces except the things on the top layer and as far as the top layer is concerned i only want it to move this corner that's the only thing i care about i don't care about the other pieces let's say that is sequence 1 and suppose you have sequence 2 which i don't care what it does to the rest of the cube but i want i mean the, to the top layer but i only want the you know these two layers to be fixed so maybe one example for sequence 2 is just you just turn the up face clockwise because that will mess up the top layer but it won't do anything to the remainder what are the common pieces moved by sequence 1 and sequence 2 it's only this corner which means by the previous theorem the commutator should only move three pieces or fewer okay and these are exactly the sort of sequences we were looking for okay you probably don't believe me uh, let's just try out let's just try this out on the uh, on the thing okay so so suppose i want to remove this corner you may have different ways of doing it any any i mean the link that you have i mean try it out on your own okay so here is one way of removing this corner let's bring that corner down not that corner up and take the rest of the thing back so this is my sequence 1 and sequence 2 is going to be up okay which only moves the top layer of course so let's ask ourselves what is the commutator of this with up going to be okay if you just take the commutator of the sequence you created right now with the up thing the only thing that changes are these three corners okay and these are the sort of moves you will often want to find like if you i mean if you just expand this this is the same thing as saying you do r d prime r and then you do up and then you undo r r prime d r and then you do up uh, okay. sir yeah uh, sir uh, someone is asking can you just repeat the, how you use sure. the theorem again okay so here is what i want to do here i mean so the sequence basic i want to come up with two sequences such that the set of common pieces moved by them is just one of them okay so here is uh, here is one sequence that has this property so this is sequence 1 what sequence 1 does is it messes up the cube in some weird way but just focus on what happens on the top layer this is the only corner that is moved okay among the top layer this is the only corner that is moved this is sequence 1 sequence 2 could just be this here the only thing that is moved is the top layer so it's like an example of something of this sort sequence 1 does something like this where the top layer stays the same except this corner and sequence 2 is like the bottom two layers stays the same except this top layer which means the number of common pieces what are pieces that are moved by both sequence 1 and sequence 2 well that's only this corner and therefore i want to say that if you take a commutator of sequence 1 and sequence 2 it should move only three or fewer pieces okay and that's what we did here so this was r prime d r this was one sequence that we had okay and we just took a commutator of this with u and you come up with some it's it's some sequence of moves on the cube but it only moves three parts okay and you can come up with your own sequence instead of d you can now probably put d2 and maybe 
you will end up with some other way of moving three corner you can you can do this on your own i mean once you know this theorem and once you know that this is how you can construct these moves you can do it okay now let's do this for edges okay so i want a sequence of moves that that only changes this one edge okay here is one way of doing it you bring this middle layer down knock that edge out of the way and then put this layer back okay this is one way of doing it but now let's take a commutator of this with you and only three edges okay and it's it's a pretty cool thing to try out i mean like you know it's uh, i mean it's just that you you can come up with your own sequence of moves and you should be able to do this if you know how to solve even one layer and you put them together and you get the sort of uh, these cool commutators that you want okay it's, it's a, yeah it's a lot of fun so let's do something even crazier okay so what i'm going to going to do is i'm going to come up with a sequence of moves that sort of does this okay from this top uh, this top corner i just wanted to flip this corner so that is i want to put the corner in the same place but in the wrong orientation okay now let's ask ourselves if i did this what would happen what is one way of doing it let's first take that corner out of the place so this is one way to take the corner out okay and now i want to put the corner back but in the wrong orientation so maybe i bring that corner back and i imagine this is white and put it up there so one way of putting that up is like this okay again don't worry about exactly what the sequence of moves is this is something you should be able to do on your own okay you don't care about what happens to the rest of the queue you only care about what happens to that top corner now let's take a commutator of this guy with you okay and it just flips two corners okay and similarly you can figure out how to just flip two edges and again nothing that i said here was like super complicated or something it's just that once you know what commutators do these are all sequences of moves that you can do on your own okay and hopefully i mean i mean again as i said i'm not going to tell you how to solve the queue but hopefully this is enough information for you to figure this out on your own okay so great so at this point uh, currently i have to go through all these animations something so now what should you have hopefully learned you should have hopefully learned that you can find your own sequence of moves that just moves three corners and find your own sequence of moves that moves three edges and you should be able to find your own sequence of moves that flip two corners and something that i didn't do but you can try and figure it out on your own basically the same thing you should also be able to find your own sequence of moves that flips two edges and if you carefully put these two together you should be able to solve the cube on your own okay there's nothing too complicated about uh, uh, about solving the cube on your own i don't know what's happening with this animation thing but whatever something okay so hopefully so far whatever we have done is i mean was fun enough that you guys are invested enough into what commutators are and you know you like the concept of commutators and so on so let me tell you other places where commutators show up uh, so parts of this might be a you know a little advanced for the the younger audience members but uh, but hopefully i'll at least try and tell you that you know commutators are a cool thing that shows up in not just puzzles and so on it actually shows up in other contexts as well okay so so okay so some of you may have seen these things called quadratic equations that is you're given an equation of this form is there a b and c are some numbers and you are asked find x okay what x satisfies an equation of this sort and this was known all the way from the babylonians uh, though not in the specific form but they knew how to solve the how to solve quadratic equations okay uh, this is something that all of you should be familiar with uh, you must have done this some point in your high school or something okay so natural question to ask is okay i know how to do degree 2 what about degree 3 okay so that is i have an equation of this form now 
I have I'm given A, B, C, and D, and I ask you how to how do you solve it? And believe it or not, this was actually I mean people used to have contests with this. Like somebody will put up a sequence of degree three equations and say, okay, whoever solves the most amount of these guys are going to be called some, you know, oh you are awesome or whatever. And uh, there were a few people who kept these formulas hidden because 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 these contests were going on. So, for example, Del Ferro had a formula. Apparently, Tartaglia had a formula. Who he did not want to reveal it. And eventually, Cardano asked him, "No, no, no. I mean, you know, can you tell me what the thing is?" And then he told him under the condition that Cardano should not publish it. But then Cardano realized that oh, this was also there with Del Ferro, and then he published it. And Tartaglia got very annoyed. I mean, there's a whole story behind uh, behind the cubic formula. Okay? okay, what is the cubic formula? It's this. Okay, you don't need to know what the formula is. It's some complicated formula, but nevertheless, it's some way of saying these are the roots of your. I mean, these are the solutions to this equation. Okay, it's some complicated formula. So now, naturally, I mean, okay, now we know how to solve three. I mean, whatever that means, at least somebody knows how to solve three, and we can ask ourselves, okay, what do you do with four? Okay, and uh, this is Ferrari's formula. Nothing to do with the car. But uh, this was his formula, and I mean, I am not going to zoom in. I mean, okay, it's, it's again some weird, complicated formula. Okay, when is this talk going to end? I mean, okay, what about quantic equations, which is like degree five equations? And surprisingly, turns out that any expression for the solutions is impossible. Like, if you want, so the formal statement is a bit more complicated. It's called expression by radicals. But basically, things that involve square roots, square roots inside square roots, you add, subtract, divide, blah blah blah. Abel and Ruffini showed that this is just not possible. And uh, so the theory that was used there was actually like developed in so much more, uh, you know, like uh, uh, I mean, it was really developed by a person called Ivaris Galva. I mean, this last name is pronounced as Galva, I mean, not Galois. Uh, but as you can imagine, I mean, you know, he was a he's a mathematician that died very very young, and it's a it's a really tragic story as well. So he was apparently, I mean, besides being an amazing mathematician, he was also a political firebrand, and he used to participate in also. I mean, 18 sort of 19th century France was a was a strange uh, time. So there was a lot of political turmoil, etc. And he the way he died was actually there was a there was an argument between him and some other person it's in fact not even clear what the argument was for and there are various sources saying different things but basically there was a duel at the end of it they basically said no let's both have a gun and let's just figure out you know you, we'll have a duel and see so two days before the duel were to happen he actually wrote down all his thoughts and sent it to his friend other friends and said look i maybe somebody else will be able to make sense of all this and uh, this theory was developed to this uh, i mean Abel and Ruffini's proof uses this, but it was like, uh, I mean, I mean, the official Galvas theory came after Abel and Ruffini's result. But the key cornerstone of both of this is commutators. Okay. And uh, okay, so here's another thing. So some of you may have done this sort of ruler and compass constructions in your high school. Okay. And maybe there are a whole bunch of things that I've just written down here. Given a ruler and a straight edge, Construct an equilateral triangle or a square or a pentagon, blah blah blah. And some of this probably you've done this in school, okay? And some of them are a bit more complicated, but it can be done, which is like the pentagon and the uh, decagon, okay? But the two which are missing here, how do you construct using a ruler and a compass a regular seven-sided figure or a regular nine-sided figure? And turns out these two are impossible, okay? And again, the the main thing is like you know, it uses that is the proof that we know right now uses Galois theory, and it's all about commutators. Okay, so in the remaining time that I have, uh, roughly how much time that I have now? Uh, uh, Amit, your uh, yeah, so around fifteen to thirty minutes. Uh, okay, okay. So I'll try to give you a sense of why commutators even show up in these things. Like when you're trying to solve the equation, why the hell should commutators be a part of this? Okay, at least I'll try to tell that. I mean, I won't be able to prove the entirety of 
the Abel roof and ASL. But we at least give you a hint of what's going on. But before I do this, I need to tell you a bit about what are called complex numbers. Uh, because it's, uh, it shows up. Some of you may have seen this already, but if not, hopefully this will give you at least a brief introduction of what they are. Okay. We probably all know what real numbers are. It's sort of written with this R that has an extra shadow on it. Uh, uh, and this is what the real is. Basically, you take the real line, any point you mark here is a real number. So root two will be somewhere here, you know, pi is somewhere here, E is somewhere here, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But you notice that real numbers have some deficits. One such deficit is that if you ask, what is the solution for x squared plus one equal to zero? And there is no solution here because whenever you square a real number, you will always get a positive, not negative number. So the left-hand side is always greater than or equal to zero. So there is no way I'm, or in fact, it's greater than or equal to one. Then there's no way I'm going to be equal to zero, okay? So let's artificially add one root for this and we'll call that i and we'll say i is a placeholder for whenever you want to take the square root of minus one. We'll just call that i. Okay. And so the complex numbers are created by what happens when you add i to the reals. So you, this is what is called the complex numbers. They are now expressions of the form x plus i y where x and y are real numbers. It's just some, I don't know, some bunch of things. I mean, we just created new numbers out of thin air. And we said, okay, these are the numbers that we're going to work with. And it's pictorially just like you have a real line. Often complex number are thought of as the complex plane where the X coordinate refers to the X part and the Y coordinate refers to whatever is accompanying the I. Okay, so this is how you would normally denote complex numbers. And adding and multiplying complex numbers are also not too difficult. So whenever I want to add two complex numbers, it's sort of easy because I can add A and C, that's the X coordinate. And I can add B and D and that's going to be this thing. So whenever I have two numbers of this type, their sum is also something of the same type, which is good. How do you multiply things? Well, let's just multiply it out and see what we get. So if I have A plus IB and times C plus IB, well, I have AC, and I have IBC and IAB, and then I have an I squared BB. But we just said I, I equals minus square root minus one. So therefore I squared is minus one. So this simplifies as AC minus BD plus I into BC plus C. So this is normally how you multiply complex numbers. The point is, okay, we just created numbers out of thin air. What's the point of this? And the thing is, there's one really cool miracle of mathematics. This is one of my most favorite results in mathematics, which is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay. The fundamental theorem of algebra says, if you have any equation of, I don't know, let's say of degree N or something, this has exactly N solutions in the complex numbers. I mean, by exactly there is a star because you need to count things correctly. And why do I say this is a miracle? Because the only thing we added was a solution to this specific equation, x squared plus one equals zero. Why should this mean that you now have solutions to every equation? But miraculously, this is true. Okay, and uh, it's a fun, uh, it's, a good, it's a good fact to know. We're just going to assume this and proceed with whatever is going to happen. Okay, so what do we want to understand? We want to say, suppose I give you an equation, can you tell me what the solutions are? And this seems complicated. Let's ask an easier question. On the other hand, suppose I tell you what the solutions are. The solutions are also called roots. If I tell you what the solutions are, can you figure out what the equation is? And this is actually easy because if I tell you the roots are R1, R2, blah, 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 till Rn, what's the equation? Well. Just take x minus r1 into x minus r2, blah, blah, till x minus r. Okay, so at least one direction seems to be easier. And let's try to make use of this. Okay, uh, so there's a, again, I want to show one nice applet. Uh, this is also something I had shared on the chat a while back. So if uh, someone can just uh, do this. So, this. so there's a Professor Leo Stein in the University of Mississippi in Oxford. Uh, who uh, who actually has this nice applet where you can put any polynomial here and the roots will show up here and then you can play around with this a little bit. Okay.
okay like for example the polynomial is the constant term is whatever this is and then this is the coefficient of x and so on so if you sort of wiggle out wiggle these coefficients the roots also slightly change okay but you can also do the other thing i can wiggle the roots and the polynomial also changes a little bit okay so this is nice sort of way of doing things like this so if i wiggle if i make a small loop using uh, what one of the coefficients it seems to change but sometimes something weird happens so pick your favorite point one of the four roots that you have and just trace what is happening i'm going to move this this a not i'm going to move it back to where it was but in a slightly complicated loop and let's try and trace one of the roots on the right hand side so let's see what happens here so when i moved a not from wherever it was back to wherever it was the set of four roots stay the same but somehow they shuffle between each other right so let me just do it once more just uh, maybe let's focus on this minus one so if i did this what used to be at minus one eventually ended up wherever this guy was so there's something non trivial happening like you can sort of move the coefficients to itself the roots also go to itself but there is something weird happening with those roots and that is what is used in galois theory and stuff okay so so let's uh, so let's start off with a simple case and here is a theorem i'm going to show there is no continuous map okay uh, this is just a way of saying that it takes the two coefficients b and c and it supports to spit out a root whenever you plug in b and c it is supposed to tell you this is the root of this one okay of this whatever equation and i want to say there is no continuous map that does this what do i mean by continuous small wiggles should mean it should go to small wiggles that's what i mean intuitively you know what continuous means if i change if i change b a little the output of this should also only change a little okay and let's see why this is true okay some of you will probably be having a question but uh, just hold on for a second and uh, this should soon answer so let's look at the same picture let's say this is the coefficients which is this whatever b comma c i'm just thinking of that as the coefficient and currently these are the two roots of the polyn of this equation x squared plus bx plus c equals 0 okay somebody tells me no 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 i have a continuous map that actually tells me what the root is okay which of which of these two is your root okay let's say someone says okay no this is the root i'm tracking now let's do something funky let's slowly move the roots but back to wherever they were okay so that is what i'm doing is i'm like slowly moving this root to this point and this root to this point but when i do this the polynomial is going to change right so so at this point uh, oh i forgot what is the keystroke for uh, pausing the thing so for example at this point there is some intermediate put position where these are the two roots right now maybe this is the polynomial and maybe these are the two roots right now maybe this is the polynomial but when i end up with the same set of roots as i began the polynomial must be the same which is why i end up with an origin with a loop here whatever i started off with i should end up with wherever i was because the roots are still whatever used to be the roots but now this is a problem for the adversary why is this a problem well this guy basically said that he was tracking this root but now i slowly moved that root here and if you wanted to be a continuous function you were supposed to track this point and what this is also root of b comma c for you and that's a contradiction okay so hopefully i i don't know how much of this was followable but we are just using the fact that if there is a continuous function and i was slowly moving this the continuous function is also supposed to track this and you can't suddenly change your answer to what root of b comma c is so to start with you said it was this guy and now you are saying it is this guy so this basically says there i mean there gives a contradiction that there is no such expression okay and some of you may be wondering wait so, sorry is there a question uh, uh, sir uh, can you just uh, repeat the explanation repeat yeah so let's just uh, start with the thing so basically someone tells us that there is a continuous function where if i feed you b and c someone says i'll tell you what the root is 
okay and then i say okay fine currently my b and c is this what is your route and then the person says no this is my route okay now let's change b and c slowly i mean let's change the route slowly and now currently my bc is whatever this point is i mean okay and i ask what is the route right now well if the adversary was slowly tracking this change then the adversary is now supposed to say this is my route okay now i ask what is the route now then the person must say this is my route and what is what is route of b comma c this is the route and he has to keep doing this but at the end of it he lands up here so now the adversary is claiming that this is b comma root of b comma c but i am like hey you started off by saying that this was root of b comma c how can you suddenly change your answer so this is going to tell you that there is no continuous map for that takes the coefficients and spits out the root and some of you may be wondering it this is like there's something obviously wrong in what i am saying we know a fun we know a way of writing down roots quadratic is something that we did in school so why are we saying that this is not a legitimate function and the reason for this is actually square root is not a continuous function because so let's look at the the left hand side is going to be some i'm this is a complex number 1 and the square root you have to choose either plus 1 or minus 1 but let's say you choose plus 1 now let's ask ourselves what would happen if i either take the square root it's actually convenient to look at what happens if i square it and look at the left hand side so the point is if you just move on one just if you just go from 1 to minus 1 the squaring actually completes a full circle so which means in terms of the square root operation if you did a full circle you actually end up with just a semi circle so the stupid thing is that the you know the i mean loops don't necessarily go to loops under these square root operations which is why i mean this is a this is a way of saying that if you want to solve a quadratic you must need a square root inside without square roots you will not be able to write down a solution for a quadratic okay okay now let's go on a little further uh, okay okay let's let's look at degree 3 and now i want to say something a bit more complicated which is that any expression that you write for degree 3 must have nested radicals what do i mean by this there must be like a square root inside a square root or something of that sort okay now why is this true how do you even start proving something of this sort okay uh, now sir yeah so there are two questions uh, in the yeah. uh, chat so uh -huh. first question is how can we proceed to prove that the root seems to switch when you slowly change one coefficient and bring it back where it was yes that is precisely why you you can if someone says that there is the solution looks like uh, b squared c plus c power 4 then you are in trouble right because b squared c plus c power 4 can't suddenly change its value from what it was to you can't change the value later on so yeah. which is why we are saying that any such expression that you need to have must involve something like square roots because it must be something that takes a loop on the left hand side to some non loop on the right hand side it must somehow break a loop and continuous functions don't do this continuous functions will always take loops to loops right so so which is why this basically says you need to have a square root inside without a square root you will not be able to do this and i want to take this a little step further to basically say that for a cubic polynomial you actually need a like a root inside a root you can't just have roots on the outside so here so how do we prove something of this sort okay let's say that you are somebody told you that there no 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 i have an expression for roots that looks like this it is square root of something plus cube root of something both the things inside are you know they are legitimate continuous functions i want to say no 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 you are cheating what you are saying is false there is no such solution how do you prove something of this sort okay so let's again do the same thing that we did last time so currently the cubic solution my current equation is b comma c comma d i mean these are the coefficients that i have and maybe these are the three roots and the one in blue color is what this guy is claiming is roots of root of b comma c comma d the adversary is claiming this is the i have picked up the right root now let's do the same thing so suppose we slowly switch the roots around this guy will do some weird loop on the left hand side but we don't have a contradiction here 
because loops need not go to loops when there are square roots involved. If I have square roots and cube roots involved, just because this guy is a loop, I am not expected to stay a loop on this side, right? So what we instead want to do is like, there must be some other kinds of loops, which actually goes to loops under these square roots and cube roots and so on. Okay, and let's ask ourselves the following. Let's say this is one loop that we have. And let's ask ourselves what will happen to this when I square this, when I take, when I take as whatever this number goes around. If I apply the square, what will happen? It's easy to see that you will actually go around the origin twice. And if you cube it, you will actually go around the origin three times. Okay, which means if I started off with this loop and took the square root, something that went around the origin twice will go around an origin once. I, all I care about is that it's a loop. Similarly, something here which went around the origin three times under the cube root will go around the origin once. So what is the observation? If you have a loop that winds around the origin at net multiple of n times, it must be some multiple of this, whatever this, if you're taking the cube root, it must be a multiple of three. Okay, then they will go to loops. So I might have cube roots, I might, sorry? Sir, can you just show the slide containing the theorem for the cubic root one? Ah, sure. Uh, so this is the this is the statement I want to prove. That whenever you want this, whenever you have an expression that looks like root of b comma c comma d, which you built using plus minus multiplication division, maybe you used some square roots, cube roots, etc. I want to claim there must be one root inside another. There must be a square root inside a cube root or something of that sort. Like if somebody told you that square root BC plus square root CD plus square root uh, BCD is an, is an answer to this, you should be able to say, no, this is false. You are cheating. Okay. So, so okay. So uh, this thing, I don't know how to skip these animations. Okay. So therefore, what, what we have learned right now is that there are some special kinds of loops which goes to loops. What are those special kinds of loops? Things that wind around the origin and that multiple of n times. But again, this n might keep changing depending on if someone told me there is a square root inside, then I want n to be two. Someone told me there is a cube root inside, I want n to be three. So it's just easier to sort of say, suppose it winds around the origin and net zero times. The nice thing about zero is that zero is a multiple of everything. Okay, then it will always go to loops. And the question is, what are loops that wind around something the net zero times? And this is where commutators come. Okay, and let's see why this is the case. Let's take some way of moving the loops here. Suppose I, I don't do anything to this, but I just move these loops around. What am I going to get on the left-hand side? It will be some weird thing. Some the coefficients will move in some weird way. But now imagine you doing the exact opposite of this right now, this loop went here, I mean, this root went here and this root went here in some clockwise fashion. Suppose I did the same thing in an anti-clockwise fashion. What should happen on the left-hand side? You should trace exactly the same thing, but in the reverse direction, right? So this is what you do for loops and inverses. So now here is how we build the commutator. So I have three roots right now. Here's what I'm going to do to begin with. I'm going to first move these two clockwise that results in something. I have no clue what it does. All I care about is that it went from one loop to another loop. And now let's move these two things. That again will do some other nonsense there. I don't care what it is. But now let's undo what we did first. What should happen? You should retrace exactly what you did in the first part. And now I undo whatever I did in the second part. And I just retrace this other thing. Now, from the left-hand side's perspective, if you wound around the origin, you anyway undid it at some point. So the net winding here is zero. But if you recall what happened, the red color used to be there, green used to be here, this yellow used to be here. But at the end of this entire operation, all those things changed. They went to some other weird uh, place. So red eventually right now is here. So let's complete the whole thing and see where red ends up. Red used to be there to begin with. And now red went back here. 
okay so which means if the adversary originally had told me root of b comma c comma d used to be this point and now i am like saying well you, you said it used to be that point now i took a commutator which is something with net winding zero and you can now say it is this point okay so now you have a gotcha point i mean okay we now have said that the adversary was cheating i gave you a loop that had net winding zero which means your starting answer and ending answer can't be different but you said you begin with you said this was where it was but at the end of this entire operation it went here so you cheated and that's how we showed that you know if you if you did not have nested square roots or nested roots inside there can't be an expression for this because we just found an example where you know a net winding loop net winding zero loop that somehow changes the roots itself so this is like the how sort of commutators show up when you try to solve equations and something you may ask what do you do for higher degree suppose i want to say that i want to say no expression that just looks like square roots of square roots can solve something what do you need to do you need to use something that looks like commutators of commutators and maybe you want square root of i mean some root inside a root inside a root then you will have to use commutators of commutators of commutators and surprisingly once you have five roots you can actually handle any amount of nesting and that's how abel rufini's theorem shows that there is no finite expression that can solve uh, this thing and this is just the starting i don't know this is like, like how at least a brief glimpse of how galva theory begins with at least even if you don't understand at least hopefully you you see why commutators show up in a situation of this okay so so that's all i wanted to say so i'll sort of just give a summary of you know what we have learned today uh, so we saw that commutators are hopefully you now understand the commutators are quite cool even if there are some things that you didn't follow uh, maybe at least for the rubik's cube is something that you will start paying attention to these commutators uh, actually something that was quite interesting to me was that even though i knew how to solve the rubik's cube i didn't realize that many of the moves i do were actually commutators so there may be some people in the audience who know how to solve the cube i mean just look back to the sequence the sort of uh, algorithms that you use and check i mean there'll be commutators sitting inside you'll see that very often okay and uh, and we saw how to find a solution to the rubik's cube on your own but my i don't know my greater uh, i don't know my greater sort of point i want to make is that you know you should try to find solutions to whatever you want to solve on your own and i don't know to me the i don't know the the journey is somehow way more enlightening than just the destination like if you know how to solve the cube you know how to solve the cube what's the big deal but if you know what commutators are if at a later point somebody gave you let's say a 15 percent hopefully you have enough insights right now to actually try and solve that on your own also or maybe somebody doesn't give you a, like a like a 2 cross 3 cross 3 cube but somebody gives you something like a 5 cross 5 cube if you are if you are sort of you know careful enough these are things that you should be able to do on your own and the thing about the journey is that it lets you know that you know maybe something that you thought you are not capable of but it sort of expands that what whatever that view of yourself i mean it tells you that no no you can do more than just that okay and uh, finally i mean the reason i gave you two completely different applications of commutators is because i mean connections can sometimes be strange i mean like you will never know like for example commutators also show up in in a lot of uh, sort of quantum mechanics as well in different contexts now would you have thought that rubik's cube had something to do with that i mean like uh, the point is i mean like things like this are useful in other contexts and it's always in, it's always good to keep an eye out for these sort of weird uh, connections that may come up and uh, yeah that's all i wanted to say and thank you thank you sir uh, the talk was really amazing how you started from your books to when like took to galva theory it was really amazing so uh, we have some questions in the chat box sure so uh, there is a question that uh, why did you only consider square root as an option for representing the roots like you you can have to an another uh, non continuous functions but why yeah, yeah. so uh, so the original galva theory only used this notion of solvable by radicals where you build expressions using square roots or something but for instance the proof that we saw uh, where we were con using continuous function you can the same proof works if you if you sort of 
throw in things like e power x sin x cos x etc etc so it's just that uh, i mean the i mean this by the way this particular proof that i mentioned for degree 3 and so on is by vladimir arnold uh, it's it's quite a it's, i don't know it's probably a very nice intuitive proof I, there are there are reasons why people studied only square roots and cube roots and not other discontinuous functions um, i mean it's just that for example if some if i told you at some point that the way you solve a quadratic equation is that you just you take sin of the first number divide by tan of the second number or something and then you will get this is a root it somehow feels unnatural right i mean it somehow feels like an algebraic expression should have some sort of algebraic uh, thing why are why the hell are trigonometric things showing up and uh, that was one reason why people looked at square roots because if you are only taking things like whatever x cube and x power 4 or something it seems like you are okay handling cube root of x and cube root fourth root of x and stuff like that but maybe not other weird uh, discontinuous functions uh, yeah so I, it's probably not the i don't know if it's a if it's a satisfying answer to the question but at least this is the at least this is what i tell myself as to why this is a natural uh, natural quest yeah ah yeah thank you sir that was uh, that was a perfect answer and uh, there uh, is another so uh, people are asking the can you just uh, briefly explain how the commutators have net winding zero oh okay sure uh, let's uh, go to uh, where, where where was the part where i gave the commutator thing this one right so let's imagine so let's i don't know let's say the origin is somewhere here and i want to know how many times do i wind around the origin okay the point is every time i went clockwise around the origin because i undid that part of the loop i also went anti clockwise exactly the same number of times right i mean like because the commutator looks like do i mean do loop 1 and then do loop 2 and then you undo loop 1 and then you undo loop 2 so whatever winding you got because of loop 1 when you undo loop 1 you will unwind that part i mean you will basically if you went around the origin clockwise three times when you unwind it you will now go anti clockwise three times so the net number therefore is going to be zero okay. oh okay sir that is yeah. so and there was uh, one more question so this is regarding your uh, root map which you defined from c2 to c uh-huh. so so the question is uh, like the the map still takes a root to a root the the loop which you did it's still taking a root to a root so uh, what what essentially is the difference there yeah yeah so which is why i which is why the the whatever this thing was phrased in such a way that i don't just want i want it to be a continuous map from pairs of complex numbers to complex numbers which means once i tell you what b and c are you have to tell me what your answer is you can't say my answer is either this guy or that guy i mean so you need to commit to your answer and this proof was basically saying that hey you can't commit to your answer because when i slowly move this root to this root i mean the roots are staying the same but the question is what is root of b comma c whatever this expression is what is that expression supposed to be if you initially say the expression is this guy and as it slowly moves around this you are supposed to i mean you are forced to trace this because you have to be a continuous function so basically i am just tying you up by saying that well okay let's see you started off with this okay good i will slowly move it here and force you to answer this other point but the polynomial is still the same and i am just using this as a way of telling you why you cheated so you are forced to therefore admit that no 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 i must break the loop into a non loop in some way and you say no no i use the square root it's a way of ad- getting you to admit that no your expression must involve the square root Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Sir, for, yeah. Sir, for this proof was the initial claim that there is only one root. No, no, no. So it's just that you know, whatever this expression is, this expression is supposed to return just a number, right? So you just say that okay, tell me which number you are returning, and I'm just saying okay, let's say you return this specific number. I mean, I'm just saying that you know, I don't want like for example, it's not fair to where was that thing. Uh, So this guy you can't say root of b comma c is minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac because to me that is like cheating you tell me which one you are mentioning 
you either say you are you are plus or minus when we put it there it's like saying if i keep plus this is always a root or if i keep minus this is always a root and yeah. you can imagine that there is no square root at this point and then you run into trouble <clears throat> in the theorem when we have uh, the map root from c2 to c we are considering whether it's continuous or not what is the metric of c2 or c3 so, so you basically look at the distance in terms of so think of uh, i mean you want to okay intuitively speaking between two complex numbers you know what the distance is just think oh, of the normal euclidean theory. yeah normal the normal euclidean, euclidean distance and whenever you talk about continuous all it means is like saying that if you change your inputs a little your output should only change a little i mean you need to formalize it in some way but intuitively it should move in a continuous way you can't have sudden jumps that's what sir would you would you please provide a solution to the two nail problem you asked in the beginning uh okay good uh, i mean it will be a let down to other people so people who don't want to see this uh, can sort of uh shut off uh, <laughs> something but so let's say these are the two nails you just do a commutator you go clockwise around nail 1 and then you go clockwise around nail 2 and then you go anti clockwise around nail 1 and then you go anti clockwise around nail 2 so it sort of it looks some weird way i mean i don't know how how else to show this but let's assume that you know i pull out one finger so that is i remove this nail completely and this thing just falls out and you can try it with your other things also and the last slide that i have is actually the solution to the three nail problem it looks super complicated but uh, i mean you can actually try it with your fingers it's it's a lot of fun actually yeah so sir, there is one more question is there some sort of an extended commutator for uh, so here we did for a b a inverse b inverse so can we do something like a b c a inverse b inverse c inverse or some sort right. like that good in fact this loop that is there is actually an extended commutator of that sort it's a commutator of commutators so that is you look at the commutator of ab and then take its commutator with c okay so in fact what i have written here is actually this guy ab a yeah, inverse b inverse and now you do c and i know now need to undo the first commutator which turns out to be b a b inverse a inverse and then you do c inverse okay so that's actually what is going on here so it doesn't i mean it probably looks a lot more complicated than that but uh, yeah this is what it is. so this is just a shorthand for uh, you do a comma b but then you take its commutator with c i don't know whether i did this or whether i did the other one that is a with b and c something one of the two yeah oh, sir i had a doubt like yeah. uh, although like we can prove that this is a solution but can we prove in some way that this is the shortest solution like the smallest amount of turns we can like so, there is no uh, so the the example that i mentioned uh, so this thing of you writing a with uh, b comma c this is a solution to the three nail problem and turns out this is the shortest solution for this specific case but not in general suppose you have four nails the right solution i mean one solution is this you take a commutator of commutator of commutators but this is not the shortest you can actually instead do you can take the commutator of ab and the commutator of c and d and then take their commutators this is actually a little shorter so there's actually a nice paper to sort of say you know what is the shortest way of looping things around multiple nails such that this falls off and so on and you can ask other questions suppose i have 10 nails but i want to make sure that i i want the picture to fall off whenever i remove two nails not one nail what do you do there there's a lot of questions you can ask here and it's just fun to try around okay sir thank you uh, and so there is another question that how do you yeah. formalize the notion of moving around roots and winding them so yeah i mean this is the part that i'm sort of i'm 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 not being too precise here but uh, 
yeah so it's like you know you should think of this as saying okay right now suppose someone tells you okay let's take this example uh, i don't know what to take uh, i don't know which one to take so suppose this is the actually maybe the, the applet might be easier so right now for this particular polynomial right now i combined all four points into a single point which i just call bc or bcd or something but it's just for mental clarity okay but what i mean by moving this root here and this root here is just think of the small operation where i move it a little and i move this a little 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 just imagine doing this slowly where at the end you this guy ends up here and this guy ends up here. so technically speaking whatever polynomial you started off with you should end up with the same polynomial so the fact that from if you move this in a continuous fashion this moves in a continuous fashion is clear and we are trying to somehow say the other direction is super restrictive like you have to use square roots or you have to use square roots inside square roots and so on and we are really making use of the fact that i have multiple points i can move them between themselves but end up with the same set of points yeah so that's the that's i don't know that to me is like the one way of interpreting it yeah sir can sir can you please explain very briefly why there is no solution to the quintic equation yeah so okay so again for a quintic equation what do you need someone will come and tell you that uh, i don't know i mean uh, suppose someone tells you that you know i have an equation that looks like square root uh, uh, square root of a plus Square root of uh, B C plus uh, square root maybe the fifth root of uh, A B I mean B C D etc etc. There's some expression of this sort that uh, someone claims is supposed to correspond to a root. Right now I look at this and say okay this looks like there is a right there is a there is some root inside another root. So I want to prove that such an expression cannot work. so my goal will now be to find a suitable commutator of commutators that does something non trivial on the root side on this side it does something non trivial like like we did like we saw towards the end that it actually moved this red piece here eventually such that any such expression is now expected to map roots to roots and that's a problem okay and somehow for degree 5 the thing that works is that you can actually handle any amount of nesting like if you ask yourself can i find a commutator of commutator of commutator of commutators that does something non trivial to the roots the answer for 5 is yes somehow for 4 it doesn't work from 5 onwards something strange happens and that's what is used in uh, the able roofing here yeah it's probably not a satisfying five, answer five, but five, that's why Like, so it's something to do with uh, like so uh, so okay may, maybe one thing you can try out is the following uh, take the three case okay right now we saw that there is a commutator that eventually ended up what it ended up doing was a three cycle right so we performed a commutator we moved this first and then we did this and then we undid that and then we undid this and that resulted in these three pieces moving in some cyclic fashion okay now just try to find the commutator of commutators on these three points you will notice that no matter what you do the points will end up with where it started there is no way of you coming up with a commutator of commutators which does something useful with three points but some of our five points you can in fact for five points you can always do something useful if you tell me that i have to do a commutator of commutator of commutator of commutator of commutators or how many ever you put you put here and say i want to do something useful i can do this in five but some of four and less the some of the the space is too small to be able to do something useful yeah so i mean i think it's best to try it out yourself and see for at least the three case to see why three won't work Uh, uh, yeah uh, and sir so there is another question that how do you relate a uh, commutators to not theory is there any relation between them uh it there is so the thing is i mean like uh, point is i mean all these knots that we saw here i mean these are not knots it's a slightly different uh, notion 
but uh, they can all be given names it's like whenever you go clockwise around nail one so basically imagine this nail one having a torch that is like you know pointing upwards and whenever you cut that line from the left to the right we will put an a whenever you cut this line from the right to left to the right you will put a b here and if you did it in the other direction you put a inverse or b inverse so this loop the name for this loop is a b because you did a and then you did b and similarly for uh, you know if you did something like this this is just a and uh, this is actually a b inverse so all of these loops have a name but the point is all of this is happening in some sense in two dimensions but when you are talking about not theory it's about something that's happening in three dimensions because you want to put this inside put this piece of rope inside this other hole and then tie it up and so on so it's to do with a three dimensional thing and even their commutators show up commutators are very 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 central it shows up in almost everything Uh, and sir, uh, there are people asking about. Uh, can you share, you know, slides and also any possible references for uh, reading more? About oh, sure. This? So, uh, so the slides I can share, but it's just that I mean, this is something on what is called Keynote, and I don't know how well it will export. I oh, mean, okay. uh, I can send the Keynote file as well, but I can also maybe send a PDF. But it may not all the animations etc. may not uh, work oh, in oh, that. Oh, okay. Uh, but. Uh, but the links are something that will continue to stay like uh, this uh, uh, whatever this alg.cubing.net i think this is a super super cool site this alg.cubing.net it's very convenient when you want to try out various things and this is just i just know i just i, know, I just had it some demos to make it easier for the talk that's all this is uh, yeah so this is something so i can send some references along with whatever uh, whatever these two pages that we use Uh, and i'll also send the slides across and uh, yeah that would be great uh, so uh, yeah so thank you sir it was amazing talk how you started from some simple puzzles which we solved in like our childhood days and then you went to galwar theory and it was really amazing and you the animations were quite fun to uh, like see how does exactly the continuous map take them to anywhere hmm. so uh, this was really amazing uh, so uh, we will have our next lecture at 2:00 uh, o'clock by professor keda damle of pifr and he will give a talk on percolation phenomena and at 5:30 uh, and at 5:30 we will have a, a talk by professor manindra agrawal the phd advisor of professor ram prasad he is currently a professor in iit kanpur he will give a talk uh, also titled covid sutra so uh, see you all there and thank you sir once again for your amazing no, no no problem yeah it, it was it a was pleasure, our pleasure I mean, to have you on stems yeah i am very glad that uh, i mean i could i had this opportunity to interact with all of you it would have been fun in person but uh, given the circumstances we should all stay safe yeah yeah thank, thank you so you much thank you very much sir once again thank you very much